This time on Earth Focus. Link TV's coverage of the Green Festival held this October in Washington, D.C., with interviews of activists and vendors and excerpts from featured speakers. Plus, Miles Benson interviews author Dr. Lester Brown about the rush to turn food into fuel and China's role in the eco economy. All coming up on Earth Focus. Recently, the Green Festival came to Washington, D.C., bringing together 100 speakers, 400 green businesses, and nearly 25,000 people for the world's largest green living consumer show. A joint project of Global Exchange and Co-op America, the Green Festival presents options in contemporary green living and socially responsible shopping, as well as presentations by prominent authors, activists, industry leaders, and journalists. Earth Focus attended the Green Festival to cover the mix and brings you this selection of interviews and speeches from the exhibition floor, event rooms, and the Link TV interview booth. Um, well, my husband and I traveled down here today to learn more about the various um, things that are out here. And um, I don't know, I think we need to do more to save the environment. I think it's wonderful to help get the word out you know, because it draws a lot of people who maybe wouldn't learn about this sort of thing otherwise. My name is Zach Lyman and Reware is a company that incorporates, attempts to incorporate solar into easily accessible products for the mainstream. This is, uh, this is our new line um, and this is a solar panel built into the front of the bag and uh, it's a very flexible, very light piece of equipment that's built right into the flap. Um, the fabric itself of the bag is made of recycled soda bottles, so kind of you've got both kind of a recycled uh, experience as well as a renewable energy experience. Um, and it's a really simple process. Uh, basically, inside the bag, what you have is a, is a wire that comes off the panel, and all you do is take the car lighter adapter that you have from your car for any device that you have, be it a cell phone, an iPod, a GPS, um, digital camera, that kind of thing. You just plug it right in here and as soon as you're in the sunlight, the, uh, the, the device starts charging. So it's very simple to use, uh, very clean, very light. The reason we're here today is landmines have a significant impact on the environment as well. And they're a hindrance to mobility, um, to access to water, uh, animals step on them, children step on them. And so the reason we sort of fit into this whole picture is it's an environmental issue as well as a human rights issue and a humanitarian issue. So it sort of covers all all things. We're really happy with the interaction in terms of particularly the youth because every single person that comes up to this table that's under the age of 18 picks up one of these dumb landmines and actually one of my board members is a school teacher and she has her students create these out of tuna cans to illustrate how children are so um, apt to pick these up out of curiosity and you turn them over and it says you just picked up a landmine and they lose their eyesight, they lose their hands, they lose their lives and as we have seen all these kids come by the table today every single one of them has picked up one of these landmines today so it just really emphasizes the reality of, of how bad these things are. The American people can make a transformation of this society from being an empire to being just a nation in a community of nations, a good neighbor. As it is right now, we are about 4% of the world's population, yet we're consuming about 25% of the world's resources. And that just can't go on. That's got to change. And that's why we do the Green Festival. Because if these companies that you see here at the Green Festival were the dominant model of our economy, we could live within our own means without invading other countries for their oil or exploiting their labor through sweatshops with low pay, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, what's going on in this movement is we're trying to redefine free enterprise from the, the dominant definition of the past, which is big corporations are free to go anywhere and do anything they want to people and planet. The new definition is the freedom of everyone to be enterprising. 
the freedom of everyone to be enterprising requires the democratization of capital. Everybody being able to get access to that startup money they need to launch their project. When we do interviews of these enterprises in the Green Festival, the number one problem that they say they have is lack of capital. What you're seeing happen in the capital markets is the capital is starting to shift because the big pools of money are realizing that if your main concern is your average rate of growth, your percentage growth in your capital each year, a young, grow, fast growing, undercapitalized sector like the green economy has better growth potential than the old industrial sector that's already had tons of capital put into it. Think of capital like cow manure. If you concentrate cow manure in a big pile, it stinks. If you spread it out evenly, it makes things grow. And capital is the same way. If you concentrate it, it stinks. If you spread it out evenly, it makes things grow. Well, I work for Solar Household Energy, and we have a panel solar cooking oven called the Hot Pot. It consists of a reflector and a pot, and together it works with just the power of the sun to create a cooking environment much like a slow cooker you would have at home. You can cook banana bread, chicken, fish, eggs, rice, all different kinds of things. We're a nonprofit organization based here in D.C., and we are working to introduce this into Central America and Mexico, as well as in Africa. And the reason that we're doing this is because there's a huge problem with deforestation. In places like Mali, the desert is advancing at 2.4 miles per year. And it causes extreme health problems as well with these women that cook inside uh, uh, cookhouses. They're inside these cookhouses for three to seven hours a day, according to the World Health Organization. The amount of smoke that they are consuming each day is the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes. So as these women, um, are facing a lot of health problems, cataracts, lung cancer, um, from the effects of cooking over a fire. My name is Emmanuel Rose and I work for the Sea Crane Company and we are involved with manufacturing LED light bulbs for the home and business. LEDs are light emitting diodes and the benefit is that they use very little electricity in order to create light. An LED light bulb can last as long as, as 60,000 hours of highly usable light. They'll last much longer, 100,000, 150,000 hours, but they'll, they'll last for 60,000 hours, which is 12 hours a day for 12 years. The energy savings is, is quite palpable. If everybody in the United States replaced just one bulb with an LED bulb, we could shut down the country's largest nuclear power plant. Why is it that the environmental organizations are not in the forefront of the movement against the Iraq war? That's one question. And I say that with all respect. I think everybody specializes. Everybody has to work in their corner of the struggle. But some issues become so transcendent and so brutal and so in your face, like the sending of young Americans to die in a lost cause to preserve the face of the President of the United States and to preserve the image of a superpower is, to me, shameful. And also, it's a, it's a war, it's a war that's fought for many reasons, fought for many reasons, but among them is the centrality of oil. So I can't figure out, maybe you can figure out with me, why the environmental movement with its commitment and fascination with the issue of moving off oil dependency towards renewables and conservation is not joining in the front lines of the pressure against the Halliburton-Cheney-Bush administration and its war for oil in the Persian Gulf. It would be very helpful to have every environmental group committed to putting pressure on Congress so that we can avoid 
token measures towards the environmental movement as long as the environmental movement is not fully engaged with trying to end the war. There really don't seem to be enough people concerned seriously about the, the idea of, um, of uh, rising water levels, but there are an awful lot of places over on the eastern shore that are only a couple of feet. You know, there's a lot of wetlands areas there. So we have to get people more concerned about that. We work also with a place called uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center, which is over on the eastern shore. And we have about a thousand acres, of only about 400 of which are currently above sea level. If it rises another two feet, we may be down to just a couple of hills here and there. So these, these are very important issues for a lot of people here on the eastern shore. So simple, we are starting Green Toe is our um, environmentally friendly line. We started it about a year ago. And what it is, it's all sustainable materials, um, top to bottom, so it's jute right here, it's like a hemp. Uh, the bottom is crepe, it's a natural rubber tapped right from the tree, um, no chemicals added to it. Uh, the laces are also jute. Um, they're all lined with bamboo to make them a little bit softer inside. Inside, this is what we call our ped bed. It's super soft and squishy. Uh, it's made with cork and latex, another natural rubber. Um, and then this guy right here is a wool felt. So all natural materials on these guys, you could bury them when you're done, is what we say. <laughs> Stain Lane um, is a name that our, our founder came up with, and it's basically a company dedicated to scaling the green movement rapidly. And um, Stain Lane actually has a couple other offerings. We have Stain Lane Government as well, and that's a, it's a knowledge base for city and state government officials that want to share best practices about sustainability programs. And then we have Sustainly.com, which is primarily voice of the consumer for them to find and share their opinions on products in the green marketplace. So what we're trying to do is just help people search um, by keyword um, in their locale, green products and services. Um, and people who want to share, they have the knowledge, we want to allow them to have a profile and share that information with their larger community. Green Festivals has been around for uh, over six years now. And our intention is certainly to bring our events to as many cities as possible. We also have to grow sustainably. These are two nonprofit organizations that are producing this. And what we've done is we've built co uh, cooperative partnerships which, uh, uh, with each city that we're at. For example, here in Washington, D.C., uh, has made a commitment uh, to be a partner and to work with us in different initiatives to uh, educate children and disenfranchised communities and to bring them together. And we've done the same thing in San Francisco and Chicago and now we're working with the city of Seattle and with the city of Boston and hopefully uh, those two opportunities will come to fruition in 2008 and uh, our horizons of course are to be in as many cities as possible and to really give folks an alternative to just the green stores that are available to them or the green service providers but really to showcase what's available around the country. We're planning to grow on a lot of different levels and uh, right now we're providing free podcasts on the Green Festival website of all of our speakers and we'll have additional interactive programming available on the greenfestivals.org website. Additionally, uh, this year we've expanded our kids space to include a formal large uh, stage where we've had musical acts and educational acts and puppeteering sponsored by Organic Valley. And we hope to really expand our children programming, especially where it comes around food and nutrition education and making that fun and interesting for kids to really understand the impact of what they eat and how that's going to affect their whole life. We're also looking to, to get into the rock and roll business or the, the music business and, and certainly add to uh, entertainment aspect, a much greater entertainment aspect to our green festivals. And as I said, we're, we'll do this slowly and sustainably in a way that really respects local entertainers and really brings the best of any particular community to the forefront and uh, also increase our audience. It's uh, a lot of times uh, perhaps someone uh, in their teens might not want to come to a consumer show but they might want to come to a hip-hop concert or a rock concert and that might then uh, get them inspired to actually walk the show and see all the different alternatives that we have to provide.
because of global warming, even the Bush administration says we're going to get up to three feet of sea level rise worldwide by 2100. And you know what? That is an appallingly conservative estimate now because of Greenland ice. How many of you have seen Al Gore's movie? You, you saw the graphic about the Greenland ice sheet. The Greenland ice sheet is vanishing. It is melting so fast. It's the largest land-based chunk, second largest land-based chunk of ice in the world. And if it melts and implodes and slides into the Atlantic Ocean, we'll get 23 feet of sea level rise. So anyway, even the Bush administration says three feet. So let's just go with that figure. You know, they don't publicize it, but in the multiple official documents from the White House and other federal agencies in the last six years have all said the following. Global warming is happening. It's driven by human beings and the use of fossil fuels. And number three, one signature impact will be up to three feet of sea level rise in the coming decades, according to the administration of George Bush. So let's go with three feet of sea level rise. If we get three feet of sea level rise in the coming decades, guess what? Miami will be below sea level. People will be living behind levees in Miami. There's very little of Miami that's above three feet, that's three feet above sea level right now. So if you raise the oceans three feet, Miami is below sea level. People, if they're going to stay there and live and work, are going to be living and working below sea level. Lower Manhattan, most of Lower Manhattan is exactly at sea level right now. I was at Battery Park in late August at high tide. The, 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 the waves, the spray were coming onto the park, onto the plaza, as my son and I walked around. Exactly at sea level right now. Add three feet of sea level rise. Lower Manhattan is below sea level. If people are going to live and work there, they're going to be behind levees. National Airport in Washington, D.C., most of Alexandria, Annapolis, Ocean City, Charleston, Savannah, Mobile, below sea level, people living behind levees. Just like New Orleans. Followed by what? Hurricanes are becoming more powerful. The biggest hurricanes are becoming more frequent. Katrina is coming here. The flight of New Orleans is coming to Manhattan because of global warming. You know, that to me is the biggest lesson of all from Katrina. It's not about levees. It's not about insufficient bottled water. It's about if you dramatically alter the one and only climate system that we have, this benevolent, agriculturally generous, 10,000-year-old climate system that you and I were born into, if you dramatically alter it by supersaturating the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, you change everything. You make sea levels rise. You bring more powerful hurricanes. And you make New Orleans become a reality all along our coast. Next, an interview with Dr. Lester Brown, the well-known environmental thinker who serves as president of the Earth Policy Institute and author of the new book, Plan B, version 2.0, Rescuing a Planet Under Stress and a Civilization in Trouble. Dr. Brown spoke recently with Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson about his new book, The Rush to Turn Food into Fuel, and China's increasingly important role in the eco-economy. There's good news and there's bad news about oil supplies, the rising demand, the rising price, and the limited supply of oil in the world. The good news is that alternative fuel supplies like biodiesel and ethanol are becoming more economically viable. The bad news is that that good news is bad news in disguise because this situation makes worse an even more dangerous crisis. Dr. Lester Brown, could you explain? We've always been concerned about the effect of rising oil prices on food production costs. And that's a, a very real concern. But of more concern is the effect of rising oil prices on the demand for agricultural commodities. It turns out that almost everything we eat can be converted into automotive fuel, either as ethanol or as biodiesel. So when you get oil prices up around $60 a barrel, it becomes profitable to convert agricultural commodities into fuel. So the emergence of the biofuel sector, if you will, and particularly the extraordinary growth and in investment that's now underway, means that um, we're setting up competition between service stations and supermarkets for the same foodstuffs. So you're saying 
automobile owners are going to be taking food out of the mouths of poor people around the world? Literally. In effect, we're setting up competition between the 800 million of us who are affluent enough to own automobiles and the 2 billion people in the world who are spending most of their money on food already. You've had a nibble of interest from China in adopting some of your ideas in Plan B. Can you talk a little bit about the implications of that? Mm -hmm. The Chinese are beginning to realize that they have some serious problems and in some ways unique problems. No large society has ever developed as fast as, as China has and, and we've recently seen that even the 9% rate, rate of growth the last few years is being recalculated at over 10% a year. I mean, it's very fast. So they're beginning to experience problems with air pollution, water pollution, some of the worst in the world. Expanding deserts as overgrazing creates grasslands into a desert water shortages, aquifer depletion, rivers running dry, wells going dry, a whole complex of issues. And they're beginning to think about what they're going to have to do to try to maintain economic and political stability. So they're beginning to think about these issues and, and how to deal with them, but it's not easy. What happens in the United States if China makes those changes and the U.S. lags behind? China will assume a leadership role in the world if, if this happens, if they start moving ahead and responding to these environmental challenges and we continue not to, um, then the world will look to them for leadership. And already China's role as an importer of raw materials and various commodities including energy, uh, oil and natural gas. Um, are putting it in a leadership position. It is becoming the price setter for a lot of these commodities because it is the major user now. I mean, for, for decades, the United States was in that role, but we no longer are. You're forecasting uh, a catastrophe for the world's forest, uh, traceable to increased use of paper over the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, led principally by China. Uh, how do you explain the increased demand for paper in a digital world with email and with computers and with newspaper circulation shrinking. In the book I point out that whereas for almost as long as we can remember we've been saying the U.S. with 5 percent of the world's people consumes a third or 40 percent of the world's resources. That was true for a long time. It is no longer true. China now consumes more of most of the basic resources than the U.S in the food sector, grain and meat, the energy sector, oil and coal, the industrial sector, steel. Of these five basic commodities, China now consumes more of each than the United States of all except for oil. The U.S. still leads in oil consumption. Meat consumption in China is nearly double that in the United States. The use of steel in China is more than double that in the United States. Now that China has overtaken the U.S. in total consumption of these key resources, we have license then to ask the next question, which is, what happens if they catch up to us in consumption per person? And if the Chinese economy grows at 8% a year, then by 2031, income per person in China will be the same as income per person in the United States today. If we then assume that their consumption patterns will be similar to ours, that is their consumption per person of various resources, then in 2031, 1.45 billion Chinese will be consuming the equivalent of two-thirds of the current world grain harvest. China's consumption of paper will be double current world production. There go the world's forests. Or consider automobiles. Imagine three cars for every four people in China, as we have in the United States today. We're looking at a fleet of 1.1 billion cars. The world currently has 800 million cars. Now, among other things, this means they'll have to pave roads, highways, parking lots, an area comparable to the area now planted in rice in China, which is their leading food staple. It also means they will be consuming 99 million barrels of oil a day. The world is currently producing 84 million barrels a day. 
and probably will never produce much more than that. What China is teaching us is that the Western economic model, the fossil fuel-based, automobile-centered, throwaway economy, is not going to work for China. If it doesn't work for China, it won't work for India. Nor will it work for the other three billion people in the developing countries who are also dreaming the American dream. And in some ways, most importantly, in an increasingly integrated global economy, where we all depend on the same oil, grain, iron ore, and so forth, it will not work for the industrial countries either. It will not work for us. So this is the big challenge that the world and our generation faces, which is to restructure the global economy, shift from a, from a fossil fuel-based, automobile-centered, throwaway economy to a renewable energy-based, diversified transport, comprehensive reuse, recycle economy. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.